Now the final thing I want to say about this graph, and, and this is of course the complete assessment, right, equity and uncertainty, is that we don't know anything, right? The recommended carbon tax, the social cost of carbon, ranges from somewhere pretty close to zero to well over a thousand. And anybody who tells you this is the social cost of carbon and then gives you a precise number without any sensitivity, without any robustness, without any confidence interval, I think that person should just be discarded, right? Or their opinion should be discarded. Person, of course, not. This, and this, this highlights just how important these ethical choices are, right? Depending on where you stand, depending on what you think the uh, pure rate of time preference should be, depending on what you think the curvature of the utility is or should be, you can come up with very different answers, very different policy recommendations, right? <clears throat> there are, of course, people who invert the whole thing, right? Who say, well, I think that the carbon tax should be 100 or maybe 200 yeah. because that's easier on the graph, and therefore we should have a pure rate of time preference of 1% and a rate of risk aversion of, what is it, 0 0.3. But that is, I think, a peculiar position. How do we deal with these issues? It's clear, just from a, a positive assessment, that these choice of parameters are terribly important. And then the question is, how do you pick them? And there's two basic approaches here. One is to think how it should be done, reason from first principles, how should we discount the future? And if you feel incapable of doing so, don't be ashamed, because this has been a debate in philosophy and religion for as long as we know, right? Uh, Socrates had things to say about this. And other people have strongly disagreed with Socrates. And, of course, not everything that Socrates says is uh, true. If you read his opinion about women, uh, then perhaps you should not put too much stock on his uh, <coughs> words. Or if you look at his opinion about slavery, then perhaps you should ignore Socrates, right? But, yeah, there is strong and philosophical and strong religious guidance on some of these choices. And you could decide, who do I like best? Do I follow the uh, advice of Jesus? Do I follow the advice of Lord Stern? Do I believe Lady Gaga uh, in these matters? And I'm going to follow their opinion here. Uh, the lady takes her proper place in history. Right? That is one thing you can do. The, the immediate problem with this is that then you essentially become paternalist or maternalist, right? That you think that your values are so important that the government should follow them and impose a carbon tax, which is essentially means that your time preference or your inequity aversion is imposed on everybody. Not that they have to share the same value, but they have to live with the consequences of that, right? So yesterday we talked about dictatorship. That is essentially dictatorship. If we follow uh, Nick Stern and say that the pure rate of time preference should be 0.1% and therefore the carbon tax should be 300, and if that is imposed, then Nick Stern has become a dictator, right? In the sense that he dictates the outcome, <clears throat> or his preferences dictate the outcome, right? So that is one route which is difficult. The other route is to look at revealed preferences, which sort of, sorry? Yeah, yeah, at, at the moment, sort of the revealed wisdom of climate policy people is that we should uh, stabilize the climate at warming of less than two degrees, right? And preferably closer to one and a half, which implies a carbon tax of several hundred dollars per ton of C. Um, that is one way of doing it, or you could look at 
other decisions that people make when they say invest in their education. It's a choice familiar with you guys. Your invest, your decision to take a year out of your working life and study a year more is essentially a decision about foregoing consumption, foregoing income, in the expectation that you would lead that you would get a more fulfilling and a higher paying job later, right? So that is an investment in the future. And that, through that choice, you have revealed your time preference. Not quite, right? <laughs> because you are uncertain, right, about what the returns to a master's degree are. So it's not that we observe your time preference, but we observe the mixture of your time preference and uh, your risk, and that is sort of like mixed up with your beliefs about how the future will unfold and the value of this degree, so we don't quite observe your time preference. And of course, education is subsidized, right? may not feel that way to you guys, but it is. So this is a mixture of a public and a private decision. So analyzing your investment in education does not reveal necessarily your time preference, but it reveals a mixture of things. And actually, <coughs> uh, Shane Frederick has a wonderful paper in the Journal of Economic Literature where he goes through a great number of studies that revealed people's time preferences and comes up with an enormous range of estimates from negative time preferences to Time preferences that are so high, right, so above a thousand percent per year, that the only logical explanation could be the only logical outcome of that should be is that those people are so stupid that they should have died a long time ago, right? If that really is your time preference, then by accident you would have, by rights, you should have killed yourself, <laughs> which you obviously didn't because they're still in the sample, right? So something went wrong in the measurement there. So the, the problem with revealed preferences is that these parameters are actually bloody hard to estimate. Um, so what I did last year is that I actually took your predecessors through, uh, through a lecture on how difficult it actually is. And that is still up uh, on YouTube, it's still, the slides are still up uh, on uh, the accompanying website, so you can look at that. And the conclusion here there is, yes, it may sort of sound appealing to you that we should just go for revealed preferences but it's actually very hard to reveal people's preferences. But as I said, instead, uh, Stephen insisted that I talk you through uh, policy advice. And for some reason, Stephen thinks that I'm good at this. Uh, so I'm going to do um, three things. Uh, essentially, I'm going to take you through two popular models of how this works and how this should work. Um, I'm going to end with saying on how I think it should work. And in between, I'm going to take you through some fallacious arguments. Uh, and I'm also just going to do some political economy about why people behave the way they do in the climate policy debate. <coughs> so that is the plan. But let's start with Pilke. <coughs> Pilke is a card-carrying political scientist. My problem with political science is that I don't fully understand it. Um, but uh, Pilke came up with this two-by-two -two classification. Uh, and the first one is uh, the one I have difficulty with. And Pilke argues that there's two basic models of how a democracy works. And one goes back to uh, Madison, uh, one of the founding fathers of the US. And Madison is very much sort of a bottom-up type of democracy, direct democracy uh, type of person. Uh, doesn't really think in terms of parties, but just thinks that there's a hustle and bustle and in the end, uh, some sort of agreement uh, is reached about uh, what uh, to do. Medicine also apparently thinks that sort of the, when you make a choice about what to do, you first have to identify the options of what you could be doing, right? We could do A, B, C, or D, and we're gonna go for C, right? Uh, but first you have to identify what is your A, what is your B, what is your C, and what is your D, right? Um, and those things come up uh, from the grassroots. Uh, anybody can essentially prepare that. And in that sort of 
frame of how democracies work, uh, the role of experts, of academics, of people who have a particular expertise about whatever the discussion uh, is on at the moment, is really to say uh, this works, this doesn't, and actually also to take a position and say, well, I actually think that this should be done, so I'm going to sort of argue for this rather than give uh, <coughs> perhaps uh, an unbiased or um, non-partisan advice. <coughs> uh, Schott Schneider, who's a lot younger, uh, but not very young compared to you, uh, thinks that democracies really work through elite conflicts that we call it democracy, but really there's strong groups that still control it and the electorate just follows one elite at some point and another elite uh, at another point. And that is really how democracies uh, work. I said that I don't fully understand uh, political science um, because even though there's clear contrasts here, the first point actually are not contrasting, right? Um, so according to Pilke, in one model of democracy, the common interests are achieved by the give and take of the political process, and in the other model, uh, common interests are identifiable independent of the special interest uh, demands on government. And the two do not contradict each other. They're just different things. Schultz-Snyder also argues that policy options are don't just bubble up, but directly it's the role of experts, academics, and, and people like that uh, to identify those options and perhaps to create new ones. And experts are really there, not so much to play a part, but really to advise on what options are available, perhaps suggest new options, uh, and sort of like assess the consequences of these. And I don't buy into this, uh, but this is what people say. This uh, bit of Pilker's work I find much more convincing. So there's different ways in which research and policy or science and policy interact. And uh, a common way of thinking about this, particularly common in natural scientists, is the so-called linear model, where essentially the idea is that you have an academic debate, you de agree on how things work, and then policy follows trivially from that. Which is another way of saying, if you knew what I know, you would agree with me. Which is complete nonsense, right? You can disagree with me even if we agree on the facts. You can still disagree with me on how best to behave, right? Um, but a lot of natural scientists seem to be thinking that this is how the world works. And a lot of the debates that is going on online around climate change and climate policy is of this nature, that those evil deniers, if only they knew that the climate sensitivity really is two and a half degrees, if only they knew that if we double the atmospheric concentration of CO2, then the temperature would rise by two and a half degrees in equilibrium, then they would agree that we should tax carbon. No, that doesn't follow, right? And I've taken you through many examples that there's a, such a long chain of assumptions that you need to make that even if you agree on all the natural science, and there's, I think, good reasons not to agree on all the natural science, but even if you were to agree on all that, that you can still, for very, very valid reasons, disagree. The implicit assumption in the linear model is that science is always objective, that whatever we research and whatever we conclude is independent of who did it. And an implication of this is scientism. And I will give you a couple of examples of scientism uh, after the break. The other model of how science and policy interact is so-called stakeholder, uh, stakeholder holder model, which really says that we go back from research to policy and back to research and back to policy and back to research and uh, back to policy. <coughs> and uh, uh, an important, a typo there, that should be researchers, um, an important implication of this is that even if politics may not directly affect the answers that researchers and academics give, it does affect the questions that they ask. And that is trivial, right? Because a lot of research and definitely a lot of <coughs> high-powered research does not happen without funding. And it is politicians who set the priorities for research funding. 
So in that sense, they definitely shape the questions uh, that academics uh, ask, and therefore also shape uh, the answers that they get. And what you often see in, you often see when, when a debate gets con contentious, you often see accusations of people being bought, that somehow they're in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry. That's not really how it works. It actually works the other way around. It's not the case that very rare that you would find an academic who changes his or her tune depending on who pays the bills. But what you often see is that politicians know what people will say and they will financially support those who they agree with. So the selection is actually the other way around uh, often. And then there is, of course, another interaction that the research sort of shapes uh, the questions uh, that are being asked by policy. That there's a lot of academics out there who try to convince politicians that their particular hobby horse is the most important problem of humankind. And some succeed, most fail. Uh, but there's always going on that my disease is more important than your disease. My environmental problem is more urgent than your environmental problem. And there is just an interaction going on. <laughs> The um, implicit assumption here is that science is not objective, but it's intersubjective. That is, sort of a group of people agrees on how things should be done, what are the important things, and what the answers are. And within those groups, presumably, you can exchange one person for the other, and you would get roughly the same answer. But that does not make it objective, right? Because a different group may come to a different conclusion. If you take this too far, you're going to get to social constructionism, that gravity doesn't exist. Gravity is there because we all believe it, and I'm actually floating in space, but it's just because you have been drilled into your brain that gravity exists, you observe that I stand with my feet on the ground, but I really don't. I'm really floating, right? Don't think we should take it quite so far. And it's actually, you can't disprove social constructionism, right? So what does Pilke conclude from all this essentially that there's four ways or five ways of policy advisors. One is uh, the pure scientist, an ivory tower sort of person who just sits there and just does research and informs the world occasionally of the findings. If there is disagreement about how to proceed, then the science arbiter may come into play. There is an academic who says, you're right, you're wrong. And we've seen, uh, you, may, you may have seen people come into this uh, in economic advice, for instance, where an economist gets on telly and says, well, this political party's plans will lead to higher economic growth and lower employment than that political party's plans. And that's a science arbiter. And if this person is right and knowledgeable, then that may help, right? There are uh, academics, researchers who are just advocates for issues, which is perfectly fine as long as they're open about it. And in some cases, it is actually perfectly fine. If we take medical research, for instance, we all agree that the role of medicine is to make people healthy or keep people healthy. So the objective is clear, and I have absolutely no problem with a doctor being an advocate for my health, right? That's what I want my doctor to do, to keep me healthy. What I also want is that my doctor goes around in the best, does that in the best possible way. And I don't want my doctor to be in the pocket of a particular company that sells a particular medicine. And even if I don't need that medicine, but I need a different kind of medicine, that that medicine is being pushed down my throat. There, I have a problem with that. And uh, Pilke would call somebody like that, a stealth advocate, right? Somebody who pretends to be neutral and pretends to have your best interest at heart, but is really pushing somebody else's agenda or their own agenda. Pilke styles himself, not surprisingly, uh, as an honest broker, which is somebody who tries to resolve policy issues by sketching all the trade-offs that are there, by suggesting all different ways of solving a particular problem, and if that person's personal preferences sort of influence the decision, the, these, these advisors, then that person, the, then the honest broker would actually be open and honest about it. 
Uh, so make of this what you will. I think that the uh, that the notion that we should be aware of stealth advocates and we should strive to be honest brokers is, I think, uh, an advice uh, that is well taken. Research, uh, academic research, answers three big questions, right? That is, what if, so what, and what to do. And what if is really the ultimate question of natural science and a lot of the social sciences that is essentially the issue of prediction. What will happen if we put more CO2 in the atmosphere? This is the positive side of doing research. And there's no dispute that that is what we do. And even if a lot of researchers are not predicting all the time, and actually most aren't predicting all the time, a lot of the things that we do in research is uncovering mechanisms that would help us predict doing observations that would help constrain our, uh, constrain our predictions and improve our predictions, but the ultimate goal there is to be able to foresee the future. The second big question is, so what? Why do we care? Why is this a problem? And this is a question where a lot of natural scientists get worried about, but it is, of course, what social scientists and, to a large degree, the humanities, I should have put them on there, uh, do, right? And this is a mix of positive and normative. The positive element is if you go try and measure what people think about things and then you somehow come up with an assessment and say, well, this problem is perhaps more important or this, uh, than the other problem or this problem is perhaps less urgent uh, than a lot of uh, politicians seem to think. <laughs> and that is not a positive question, right? That is strictly normative because as soon as you sort of like say climate change will affect x and that is what you emphasize and of course you've excluded a lot of other things and as soon as you say climate change will reduce gdp in the u.s by 10 percent by 2100 you've sort of like shines through that you don't really care about what's going on in the rest of the world because you focus on this particular thing right so the question of so what immediately implies a question about who matters. And a lot of the stuff that I've been giving you over the last few weeks has made the implicit assumption that the only thing that really matters are humans, which is a natural thing for me to say because, believe it or not, I am human. But other species may completely disagree with me there, right? That humans are the only things that matter. And then the first question is what to do, right? So given that we have a model that predicts the future and given that we have sort of prioritized uh, or decided what we want to achieve, how do we get best get there? And this is a question that a lot of public economists are involved in, uh, but of course, and I should have added that, also engineers uh, do this, right? And doctors do this. For engineers, if you decided that we're going to want to cross the river, how do we best do this? Do we build uh, a bridge? Do we dig a tunnel? Do we decide to build a bridge? What type of bridge do we build? Those are, of course, questions uh, that need answer and where uh, uh, academics uh, get involved as well. As I said, one of, one of the big issues, one of the big tensions in the climate debate is that there's a lot of natural scientists around who are very comfortable with what-if questions, but during their studies never have never been confronted with so what and what to do. That's not something that they have been trained to think about it and how to behave in such a situation. And when I started studying uh, econometrics here, in the very first lecture, and I think it was Kuno Huisman, who's long retired, so you haven't met him, stood in front of the class and said, chances are that one of you guys will be one day the governor of the central bank, right? This was before the euro. Um, so the probability was actually a good bit higher. And that is a position you need to prepare for in your mind. Because if you're the, the governor of the central bank, then yes, you may be a brilliant monetary economist and you may know perfectly how the economy works and particularly the monetary part of the economy. But that is not all the governor of the central bank does, right? The governor of the central bank also makes decisions on how, at what level, to set the interest rates. You're no longer Ben Bernanke, who is a 
brilliant monetary economist, no, you're Ben Bernanke, the man who sets the most important price in the world, which is a different thing, right? In academia, we write research papers, and the, the aim is to convince our peers that we're so very clever. If you're the governor of the central bank, the aim is to do the right thing. And if you mess up, that has real consequences for a great many million people. And as economists, we have been thinking about this from a young age on, or we should have been thinking about this from a young age on. Natural scientists don't, it's an ir irrelevant question for a natural scientist. If you study clouds, you study clouds. You will never be put in the position that you are in control of these clouds. And that is therefore a question that has never come up during their study. Now, to finish that bit, these two uh, gentlemen have come up with this thing called post-normal science. And post-normal science is a response to Thomas Kuhn's normal science. So if you've read Kuhn, it's a, it's a good writer, a uh, deep insight. He describes in his book about normal science how natural science behaves, how individuals in the natural sciences behave and how the collective uh, behaves. And uh, deep insight. Kuhn is very clear that this does not apply to the social sciences. In his introduction to the, this book, he says very explicitly, I am describing the natural scientists, sciences. This is what's going on in a chemical lab. Gary Revitz and Sylvia Funtewitz started this thing called post-normal science, and they say, well, normal science, in the Kuhnian sense of the word, word does not apply when facts are uncertain, and when values are in dispute, when stakes are high and when decisions are urgent. These are the so what and what to do questions. This is not the what if question. This is not something normal science, natural science was meant to deal with. And they rightfully identify that natural scientists in the traditional training are at a loss how to cope with such a situation. But that follows trivially from the fact that Thomas Kuhn never talked about anything but the natural sciences. They correctly identify the problem. They don't really work out what to do instead. They just say, well, natural or normal science does not apply. We should do something different and because it's new. Complete nonsense, of course, that this is new, right? If you are, Aristotle is typically regarded as the founding father of physics because his work is the first that survived, right? He probably did not sort it out uh, all, all, all himself. Aristotle is also considered to be the founding father of philosophy and of economics, right? He, yes, he's figured out things about how the world works, but he was also bang in the middle of all sorts of policy debates at the time, right? So there's nothing new about it. Uh, but because they thought it was new, they put the word post on. They... <coughs> Their main advice is that, yeah, it doesn't work and we should think of something different, but they don't really offer really what to do instead, apart from let's have lots of stakeholder discussion. But it's, it's very, very popular. These two guys are extremely influential and uh, almost, particularly Ravitz, almost revered in uh, certain circles. I don't think they have a lot to offer, uh, but I think you should be aware of that. I'm going to talk about the political economy uh, of the climate debate. Uh, and this is something that I'm actually uh, more comfortable with than the stuff I did before the break. And I'm going to start with uh, talking about the role of science. So in the olden days, assuming I'm talking to a Christian audience, which is not a universally true at the moment, I don't think. Uh, but in the olden days, things were simple, right? There was the church and the Bible offered two things. One, it gave a theory of how the world works, of how things are and why things are. It had a predictive element to it. And it also told us how to behave in that world, right? How to be a good human with the aim of getting into heaven, right? And other religions, of course, have similar things, that there is an element in the sacred texts about why things are, and there are norm that's a positive element, and there's normative elements on how to be good. Now, that is how things used to be, um, but the Enlightenment, of course, separated that, right? This 
enlightenment separated the what if questions from the what to do and the so what questions. And that has confused a lot of people and has led to uh, issues. And the, the, the first thing to notice here uh, is, of course, that whereas the dream of enlightenment was that everybody could work out how things worked from first principles by looking at observations and that sort of stuff, and we should never trust a priest or a holy book to tell us how things were. We should trust our own eyes and ears. That was the ideal of enlightenment, but it has completely disappeared. You guys are being trained to be economists, and that means that you don't know a lot about political science, and you don't know a lot about psychology, and you don't understand computer science, and you don't know nothing about physics. And for those areas, we trust, we trust experts. Uh, and that leads to, I mean, we're back in the situation. I mean, I don't know how a mobile phone works. I just believe the expert, right? Just as people used to believe the priest that, yes, this is how it works. I mean, mobile phones is relatively easy because I don't know how it works, but I know when it fails, right? Uh, so I'm clever enough to work out that it doesn't work. And for those sort of things, yes, we have expertise and we sort of like can tell that this company puts crap products on the market and that company doesn't. But if we are talking about such stuff as climate change, then there's 30 models out there that have different predictions of how climate change will unfold in the future for the same emissions. There's no way of telling which model is true and which model is false, right? Because these are future predictions and we have to wait 50 years before the observations will tell us this model was right and that model was wrong. So we have to trust the experts. And it's not like with gadgets that we can tell this obviously failed within a day or two. Uh, no, we have to wait decades. So we're essentially believing experts. <coughs> uh, the problem with experts and the problem with the field of science is now so vast that people aren't experts, right? People are experts in a very particular and typically a very narrow field. And that is uh, leading to uh, abuses. Here is Scott Lynn, and I don't know who that is, uh, says that <coughs> scientists have again landed a spacecraft on a proverbial dime on a planet 40 million miles away that rotates at 231 meters per second. True. I think I'm going to trust them on this climate change stuff. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says similar things. I don't know who said it first. Uh, this is a very prominent Physicists in the United States, science and engineers launched inside from Earth a moving platform across 300 million miles to arrive on Mars. Uh, a moving target will be seven months later landing safely to do, <coughs> to do geophysics at the Martian equator. And you have a problem listening to us about climate change. The first thing is true and it's highly impressive. And I'm pretty sure that nobody in the room, and definitely not me, could do this. It doesn't follow that therefore people are right about climate change because these are completely different scientists, right? It's a completely different discipline that puts uh, insight on Mars. People don't talk to each other even. Like, what sort of nonsense argument is this? It's complete and utter bollocks, right? To say, well, NASA is great, and therefore we should believe the Met Office. Another problem uh, with this separation uh, that came uh, with the Enlightenment, is that a lot of people don't like this. A lot of people have sort of this inner yearning of a grand unified theory that tells us how the world works and how we should behave in this world. And they think that those questions come together. And therefore they turn to science for moral guidance. And that is exactly not something that science can provide. But a lot of people turn to science for moral guidance. And there are people in academia who quite enjoy that and give in and provide that moral guidance. And you often hear academics argue, often implicitly, that because we are smarter in our discipline, that also means that we are better and wiser. That doesn't follow. The fact that you're a brilliant brain surgeon does not make you a good person. And often this is implicit in what academics say. Some say it quite explicitly. John Broom of Oxford <coughs> says that people with an IQ that falls under a certain threshold should not have to vote. He explicitly argues for that. And he put that 
puts that threshold pretty high. There are arguments that at retard that people should not have the vote, right, because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, but he would put the threshold at 120 or so because he is above. And this is this is just a categorical error, right? Yes, you may be smart. That doesn't make you good. And there's pre plenty of examples of people who are not that smart, but actually very wise and uh, very decent people, right? And the other way around. Uh, there are, you can find some pretty nasty people in a university, working in a university, and then you probably come across uh, one or two. The other things going on, and it sort of follows uh, on this, this is what David Attenborough said at the start of the week. The collapse of civilization is on the horizon. Fate uh, of the world is in their hands, the people who are gathered at uh, Katowice. Collapse of civilization and the natural world is on the horizon because of climate change. David Attenborough. Of course, the uh, famous BBC uh, documentary uh, maker. And climate change is often a discourse of fear. A lot of things that you read in the media, that you read in the uh, pamphlets of the environmental movement, is about a discourse of fear. And here we're looking at, uh, this is the World Wide Fund for Nature, uh, stop climate change before it changes you. Good picture. There's no relationship with any fact whatsoever. Another Worldwide Fund for Nature, the poor seal drowning, uh, Lady Liberty being washed away by the sea. These are the sort of pictures that you get about climate change. Uh, and if you listen closely to what Greenpeace or some of the Green parties tell you, then emissions are sort of portrayed as sin. And climate, is, climate change is Armageddon. And there will be a final reckoning for our sinful behavior. But fear not, you can atone by reducing your emissions. This is the old Christian message, right? And a lot of other religions too. So environmentalists like priests offer redemption. Environmentalists offer redemption. They offer other things. And the reason, the reason that they do this is very simple. They meet a demand. People would apparently like to be told this. Throughout history, there's always been somebody telling you that you're sinful, but you can change your behavior. And people apparently want to be told this. The reason that people do this is in the old days, the church would collect tithes, right? Then you would pay a church a tax to the church. Nowadays, you can contribute money to Greenpeace, right? That is why they do this. They fulfill a demand. They tell their members what their members want to hear. It's a free country, freedom of organization and everything. But besides this sort of this story that people apparently are interested in paying for, they also offer two other things. Right? And one uh, is the feeling of moral superiority, that I have done something good for the environment so I can feel good about myself, and perhaps I can feel better about me, or I can feel better than you. And of course, you create a tribal group, right? You create a group to belong to, me and other environmentalists. And that is another deep yearning of people, that they want to belong somewhere. And the environmental movement offers all these things. And that is why they behave the way they do. What do politicians make of, uh, of this? And what do bureaucrats make of this? Climate policy is the best problem for a politician you can imagine. Why? You can claim to want to save the world. The fate of the world is in your hands, as David Attenborough says. Politicians are often sort of like full of self-importance. They can be. They can be Bruce Willis. They can save the world. What better thing for an egomaniac to tell yourself and others that that is what you're doing. Nothing less but saving the world. And if it then doesn't work, if you don't quite get your actions through, then there's always an opposition party to, to blame, or in the international negotiations, there's always a Johnny Foreigner to blame. We would have saved the world were it not for Trump, were it not for the Chinese or the Indian. But we did our best, so we are not to blame. You can often shift the real action to your successor. So between 1990 and 2016, greenhouse gas emissions in the Netherlands fell by 0.4% per year. The government has decided that emissions between 2019 and 2030 should fall by 4% per year. So that's an a tenfold acceleration. That's what the current government has decided. But by 2030, they're out of office, right? So their successors will get the blame for not delivering on their promises. What more do you want as a politician? Because likely your successor is the opposition. So not only do you make a promise that you say somebody else should deliver, but you also create a stick to beat the opposition with in the future. What a wonderful plan. 
You can, of course, uh, the things that you need to do, you can give subsidies to people who voted for you or people who supported you in some other way. You can distort the market to create rents, to reward your political allies. And, of course, you can uh, distract attention uh, from your failings. Right. So the uh, person you see here is Christine Lagarde, <coughs> the current uh, head of the International Monetary Fund. And in a series of interviews over the last couple of years, uh, she has been asked, so, and this is uh, the first time she was asked, what keeps you up at night? was a question that popped up during an interview. And she said, climate change. She took it a step further. Unless we take action on climate change, future generations will be roasted, toasted, fried, and grilled. Great slogan. But why does Lagarde say this? C is the head of the IMF. C is in charge of monetary policy across the world. That is her job. Has she done well? Actually, Lagarde was the finance minister for France when the, <coughs> when the euro was created. No, uh, she was somewhat high up in the French government when the euro was created. She was the finance minister when the euro zone crisis exploded. As head of the IMF, she still partly oversees the mess that is the euro. She still oversees the imbalances between the US and China. That is her job. And she's not doing a very good job. She is a hero because she talks about climate change, which is not in her mandate, right? If nothing happens with climate change, it's not because of Lagarde did something or didn't do something. She has no influence there whatsoever. But she does deflect attention from what can arguably be said to be her failing. Same for Ban Ki-moon, right? The previous Secretary General of the United Nations who oversaw civil war and war going off in all sorts of places across the world and it was his job to make sure that it didn't happen and it did. What does he talk about? Climate change. Same for uh, Secretary Kerry, right? The Secretary of State of the United States who also oversaw all this stuff. <coughs> what does he want to talk about? Climate change. This is not his primary responsibility. Well, it's, climate change is absolutely wonderful if you're a politician. It's also great for uh, bureaucrats. So what I've argued, right, is with Tim Bergen, if we have one problem, we need one solution. With Beaumont, you can say, well, the cheapest way of achieving a particular target is to impose a uniform cost on all emitters. And then with Weizmann, we can say taxes are better than tradable permits. So what we want is an increase in, we want a carbon tax. A carbon tax is an excise, essentially on energy and agriculture, agricultural products. We already have such excises on energy and agricultural products. So really what we want to do, climate policy, is that we should raise those excises. That's no bureaucracy whatsoever, right? Because we have those things already, and all companies that sell these things have those excises or the systems to levy those excises in place. The finance ministries have ways of collecting this revenue already, or the taxman has uh, ways of collecting this revenue. So the only thing you need is a small team within the finance ministry to set the tax and to monitor uh, the proceeds, right? So you can do that for a country like the Netherlands with three people. It's minimum bureaucracy, right? Because it piggybacks on an existing bureaucracy. Instead, what we have seen is an explosion of bureaucracy around climate policy, an absolute explosion of bureaucracy. And that's what Niskanen said bureaucrats do. Bureaucrats, the aim of a bureaucrat is to maximize the size of his desk or her desk. And that's what we've seen happening. There's no numbers on this. There's anecdotes, right? I, I mean, I'm now so old that I recall the time that you could actually fit everybody who knew something about climate change into a room the size of this, right? Uh, that is no longer the case. What we do have measures for is what is happening on the international Scene. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the United Nations Framework Convention or the meetings under the United Nations Framework Convention. In blue, you're looking at the number of meetings that are organized by the United Nations Framework Convention. And in 1995, when it entered into force, one meeting was organized in Bonn. And that is actually what the treaty says. There shall be a meeting every year. But then it turned out that actually the negotiations became com complicated, so they decided to do two rounds of negotiations per year, and then it got more complicated still, so they now have actually four rounds of negotiation per year. 
and then they created a subcommittee, uh, and then the committee started creating subcommittees, and they meet. And now it's so complicated that people actually need training in order to participate, so they're organizing training sessions. And they're now having two or three meetings every week, right? It's a permanent negotiation, essentially. Uh, so that is what you see in blue. Uh, in red is an attempt of quantifying the cost of all this. So at the first conference of the parties in Bonn in 1995, 757 people attended. Now at the 24th COP in Katowice, that is going on now, there's 30,000 people. There's 30,000 people pretending to negotiate. You can't have a discussion with 30,000 people. It's hard enough at the beginning with the 757. If you just add up the salary, an estimate of the salary and their travel cost, <coughs> you end up with the blue line, uh, sorry, the red line, and we're now spending well over $150 million per year just on the negotiations. Not the preparation for the negotiations, not the debriefing, not the consequences from these negotiations. Uh, $2 billion has been spent on this circus. And for what? Well, emissions. Uh, this came out yesterday. There was jubilation uh, a few years ago when emissions went down. <laughs> there was jubilation uh, before that as well when emissions went down, when emissions, global emissions of CO2 from fossil fuel combustion and cement have not really stabilized or fallen. A lot of these negotiations seem to, at first sight, seem to have sorted very little effect. But the bureaucrats are happy, right? Because they have a budget, they can travel, they have people to help them. They have money to spend on consultants, commission reports, and so on and so forth. It continues there. Why is the climate debate so complicated? Climate is very important, right? Everybody talks about it. So if you are worried about something else, then nobody listens to you. Because everybody's talking about climate. So what do you do? You say that climate is a human rights issue, climate is a racist issue, no climate justice without gender justice, climate is a feminist issue, give me a break. I mean, all these things are important, don't get me wrong. Most of these things have very little to do with climate change. And there's, of course, other examples there that climate change is also, climate policy is also a way of going after capitalism. Right? And you see a couple of examples uh, here. And Naomi Klein is, of course, the most prominent uh, example of that. If you read that book, it is pretty clear that she has fought long and hard about how society, in her view, should be reorganized. It's also pretty clear that she hasn't got a clue about climate change or about energy policy. Completely just basic mistakes, right? But, yeah, this sells. And really, this book is about how climate change is sort of the way of bringing about the revolution that she wants to see. That's what the book is about. It's not about climate change, it's about the failures of Capitalism. And then there's a couple of fallacies that people make. Uh, the, the one that you often see is something like this. What you're looking at here is the CO2 concentration over the last 800,000 years, reconstructed rather than measured, of course. And what you see is that it went up and down and up and down with the uh, ice ages. And then all of a sudden we are in uncharted waters. And because we are in uncharted waters, we must do something about this. We are also uh, in uncharted waters if it comes to the number of years of schooling that people get. We are in uncharted waters if it comes to the number uh, of people living in a democracy. So the fact that something is unprecedented doesn't make it bad. Women's rights are at an unprecedented level at the moment. Good. Not good enough. So this is the so-called naturalistic fallacy by Moore or the Isolde fallacy by this is the best picture of uh, Hume, right? I mean, he looks so silly. Where essentially people confuse the way things are with the way things should be. Uh, the guy who best expressed this is, of course, uh, Schiller. He of uh, Ode to Joy, uh, the famous romanticist, who argued that because God is perfect and because God has created the world, the world must be perfect. And therefore, anything we do to change the world is blasphemy. That is the is old fallacy. That is uh, the naturalistic fallacy. Things should stay as they are. And that for many things, we know evidently this is not true, I hope. So for climate change, it just doesn't... Yes, climate will be different than it was. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? 
Should we worry about this? Yes, no. Should we do something about this? Climate change is also often presented as a consensus. 97% of scientists agree climate change is uh, real and human-made, right? <laughs> Make it better, right? The, the, what matters is the strength of the argument, not the strength of the person who makes the argument, right? Enlightenment. The fact that the Pope says something doesn't make it true. The fact that all priests agree with the Pope doesn't make it true. The same is true for scientists. What matters is the strength of the argument, not the numbers that make the argument, right? And now going back to uh, scientism. Climate action is urgent. The science demands it. The science demands what? Science doesn't tell you what to do. This is so-called scientism. There's somehow science has a moral value and somehow it tells us what to do. So if you're on the beach and you see the waters receding very rapidly, then science will tell you that there's a tsunami coming. Science will also tell you that if you run for the hills, you increase your chance of survival. Science does not tell you to run for the hills. It's your survival instinct that tells you to run for the hills. Science will tell you that the survival instinct in most people is very strong. And therefore science predicts that many people will run for the hills. But science does not tell you to run for the hills. Similarly for climate change, science tells you that if you put more CO2 in the, in the atmosphere, the planet will get warmer. Science will tell you that there has consequences for the natural world, for the built environment, for human welfare. Science does not tell you that you have to reduce your emissions, that maybe because of a sense of obligations to future generations or people in faraway countries may have to do with because you realize that this is an externality and it's an efficiency problem. Science does not tell you to impose a carbon tax. Go ahead. But if you're not telling you to impose a carbon tax, would it not also tell you that the CO2 reduction is required for certain natural Absolutely. So it does tell you to reduce CO2? No. Okay, that's <coughs> Only if you have a desire for those natural balances to remain. It follows from your objective function. It follows from your utility that you want to reduce emissions. From your utility function, not from your utility. It does not follow from the science. This is merely natural science in this case. Yes, but also economics doesn't tell you. I mean, what an economist will tell you is that if you have an externality like CO2 emissions and you want to restore efficiency, you want to restore a Pareto optimum, then you should apply a Pigou tax, a carbon tax. But nobody says that a Pareto optimum is what we should go for. The economist's recommendation that we should have taxes correcting externalities follows from a utilitarian framework that says we should strive for the greatest good for the greatest number. But who says that we should? Bentham said we should. Who's Bentham? He's a dead guy, right? And that conditionality there is terribly important. What does this all imply? So if you are, for some reason or other, you don't like to have a carbon tax imposed on you, what you, of course, could do when Gutierrez, who is the current uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, when he says something like this, that the science demands it, you could, of course, say, no, 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 uh, Mr. Secretary General, you've made a categorical error. Science does not command this, and really this follows from your value system and your desire to correct externalities. If you have 10 seconds on telly to shout something, it's much easier to say, okay, you say that the science says it, I said, say that the science is a load of crap. That is a much more powerful methods, short and punchy, that you can make. So by phrasing these things as scientific imperatives, you invite people to attack the science rather than your curious train of thought. If you don't like feminists, then you can, of course, argue that climate change is not a gender issue, but then you would need to make a subtle argument. It's much easier to say that climate change isn't real. If you don't like attacks on capitalism, then you could, of course, make the argument that the system of tradable permit is actually perfectly in line with capitalism, and then you make a subtle argument. It's much easier to say that humans have no role in past and future climates. So by sort of creating these bandwagon effects, 
by sort of this impure argumentation, you invite people to attack the science. And that is what has happened. And there's genuine doubts about climate science. There's people who genuinely are concerned about evidence making and those sort of things and how much we really know. But the vast majority of people who go after climate science really have objections to climate policy rather than to climate science. But it's just much easier to attack the science. It's a much more fancy method that's just good PR. Uh, climate science is far from perfect. How should a policy advisor behave uh, in all this? And uh, one thing I should have said uh, earlier uh, when I talked about uh, the governor of the central bank, you guys will be in positions of power sooner than you think. Small power to begin with, but some of you will rise to positions of great power, right? And you better get that stuff right. So what to do? And uh, unfortunately, uh, the answer is just be sensible. So policy advice necessarily combines positive and normative uh, elements. And you should just be very clear there, very open, that this is stuff done by humans, and humans are fallible. And you are, therefore, fallible as well. And you have biases as well. So what I've done throughout the lectures is that i put up pictures of the people who came up with certain elements of evidence or certain theory. And that is not usually done, but I did it explicitly for two reasons. One, to show that economics has a problem with women, and it really does. For a long time, we sort of thought, well, this is an issue, this is a generational issue, and over time, we go to roughly parity between men and women in, uh, in economics. For a long time, that was true, but around the year 2000, the number of professional economists that are female sort of reached 20%. And now in 2018, it's still 20%. So it seems that economics has a real problem with women. What you've also noticed is that all the pictures I put up, and not only most of them were dudes, but they're also white dudes. And that is also a thing to keep in mind. There's plenty of evidence that things such as risk aversion and time preference and inequity aversion are different between religions, for sure, maybe between ethnicities, those things are often hard to tell apart, uh, they're definitely different between the genders. And that means that we build in perhaps blind spots and perhaps uh, certain biases that I, as a rich, white male, do not recognize. And that's something to keep in mind. One thing we did last year in the exam, and one thing we did, uh, we're going to do this year in the exam again, is ask you the question, so who did save and vote for in the last elections? And who did I vote for in the last elections? And these are the results from last year. And what you see is that some people thought that Stephen is pretty right-wing, and others thought he's pretty left-wing. And your uh, colleagues of last year thought the same about me. So we've done, uh, I think, a decent job of hiding our own preferences. Either that or those guys and girls really don't understand politics. It's one of the two. Uh, so the question is there again this year. Obviously, you won't score any points for this, but it sort of helps us at least, because if you all correct, uh, correctly guess who I voted for, and obviously I've not been unbiased, and obviously my personal preferences shown through my lectures. Because of these things, it is good to have panels of experts rather than single experts. Sometimes panels are boring because all the experts agree. It's actually a good thing, right? It means that, yes, this seems to be a robust conclusion, but never rely on a single witness, right? And yeah, we should embrace people with strange opinions, provided that they're solidly founded, because they may uncover blind spots that we have. And of course, beware of uh, charlatan. And what we should always do is, whenever there's normative elements in our analysis, we should always make the reader or the listener aware that these things are there. And of course, the, the, the prime example in this context is the pure rate of time preference. You should never give the social cost of carbon. Always give the social cost of carbon for different pure rates of time preference. Because who am I to tell you how to discount your future? So yeah, this is just common sense, a cartoon here that, yes, there is a great preference for simple but wrong answers, and unfortunately that doesn't work in a complex world, right? And we should just have to bear with that.